you've heard it said before, right? I don't want to give any sort of, uh, well, anyway. Um, a couple things I wanted to mention before, well, it's related to the message here, but the uh, something that's really been on my heart and mind since Pastor, about, I don't know, what is, it's been six weeks, I guess, since we've been on this topic of, really, I'll just call it kind of your, uh, your authority, your spiritual authority. And um, something he said probably about a month ago, it was really important to me as he was talking about that authority and um, like what I did when he was talking about that is I, I thought about, well, how in the world, how in the world do we, do we operate, how do we, how do we get that authority, how do we operate in that authority? Because I think a lot of us a lot of us probably call ourselves Christians, right? But to some extent, Miss M does, nobody else does. Miss M does, though. I heard you say amen. So hopefully all of you here, right, if you're in church this morning, either you're, you're seeking, right, maybe, you're, uh, maybe you've heard about Jesus and this thing of eternal life, and you're seeking. But I, I'd have to venture to guess that most of you here this morning call yourselves a Christian. But his pastor was talking about that authority uh, about a month ago or over the past six weeks. I, I really started to ask myself the question, well, what does it take to get that authority and to operate in that authority? And I might rub some people the wrong way when I say this, but I think it needs to be said. And pastor, please correct this if this is wrong. But I firmly believe that just because you're a Christian, you call yourself a Christian, does not necessarily mean that you get the authority and you operate in the authority. All right, good. I've got some agreement there, because that could be a touchy subject, especially in today's world, where everybody's offended by everything. I'm actually surprised half of you didn't walk out when I said that. Like, just because you're a Christian doesn't necessarily mean that the authority that Jesus himself talked about that you get that authority and you operate in that authority just because you say, yep, Jesus is my Lord and Savior. That's what a Christian is. Somebody who says, Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I believe in the death, the resurrection, and, and eternal life. That's, that's simply what a Christian is. But I'll say it again, that I don't necessarily think that that is what allows you, quite honestly, to get that authority and to operate in that authority. So you might remember, I think it's been about three weeks, maybe four weeks ago, I was up here talking about on the topic of what is a disciple. You all remember that, that those that, that were here? What is a disciple? So even stemming from that message, stemming from that message, I, um, well, I'll, I'll, I, was, I talked to you about what is a disciple, and I, I walked through four points to kind of highlight what a disciple is. And the point number one was, if you want to be a disciple, this is a recap of the message from about a month ago, but if you want to be a disciple, number one, you must love Jesus more than anyone or anything else. All right, that was point number one. Number two was the disciple must take up his what? His cross and follow Jesus. We all have a cross to bear, right? You got you to gotta take that up and you got to choose to follow Jesus. It is a choice. You got to choose to follow Jesus. So that was point number two. Number three was the disciple must turn the title deed of their life over to Christ. Brother Wayne would know what a title is. He's, a, he's an attorney. A title is basic. What that means to turn the title deed of your life over to Christ is that means that your life is not your own. Your, your life is his. He, he owns it. That's, and you're, you need to turn that title that ownership of your life over to him, okay? Number four, I wasn't going to, I was about to say most importantly, but I, I think all four of these are hand in hand, equally important. Number four is a disciple must impact the culture. We have to impact the culture. Have to do it. So that's what, that's what it is when I ask the question, what is a disciple? It's those four things. 
Love Jesus more than anyone or anything else. Take up your cross and follow him. Turn the title deed of your life over to Christ. And you have to impact the culture. So this morning, what I want to ask you is, are you a disciple? Are you a disciple? So I talked about what is a disciple. <laughs> and hopefully you were asking yourself that question after the last message, am I a disciple? I told you what one is. Now you have to ask yourself the question, am I that? Am I doing those four things? You know, many of you have heard, right, on the news and what's been, I mean, well, I said on the news, you got to, depending on which news source you're, you're watching, I mean, many of you have heard about this revival that's taken place down at Asbury University in Kentucky, pretty, pretty phenomenal thing. Many are calling it a revival. CNN calls it a nonstop church gathering. Must be hard for them to say revival. I saw an article yesterday morning that said it was a nonstop church gathering. <laughs> I'm like, okay. It was, anyway. And actually, I heard that there's a revival starting at Cedarville University as well in Ohio. I don't know if anybody else saw that or not, but people are traveling from all over the U.S. to be, and maybe the, the world, I don't know, really know for sure, but I know for sure the U.S., They've been traveling all over the place to be part of this Asbury revival. And I have to imagine, you know, that out of the thousands of people that have been participating in this revival, if, I mean, tens and if not hundreds of, of, of those people are, they have made a profession of faith, right? So all of them likely have gone there, already know Jesus, but I have to imagine that there's some that are brand new to it that are going there and experiencing the Holy Spirit, and they're, they're now they're making a profession of faith. And I'm, I'm using that very intentional language, profession of faith. We don't say hundreds of people were saved because we don't know if they're really saved. We hope they're saved, right? We really hope they are. We pray that they're saved, but only time will tell if they're really saved. And how can you tell if a person is saved? I mean, is it, is it because they call themselves a Christian? I don't necessarily think so. Is it because they go to church? Is that what makes somebody saved? Of course not, right? We all know that, or at least I hope we do. That we, that, that's not what uh, tells if a person is saved, whether they go to church to not, or, or not, or whether they call themselves a Christian or not. I think, I think the only way that you can tell if somebody is saved is by seeing the results in their life. Okay? The reason I say that is because the Bible tells us that you will know them by their fruits. So I don't feel like I'm totally off there. I think I put the two and two together there. If you want to see who a real Christian is, who a real believer is, you'll notice them by their fruits. That's what the Word says. Not telling you anything different than, than what Paul, I think, was the one that said that. It also says, the Bible also says that faith without what? Works. Faith without works is dead. So time will tell if those, those people that are making a profession of faith, time will tell if those are real conversions. But we absolutely pray that they are because it's not enough to just come forward and profess. We need to go forward as Christians, and really that is the key to Christian life, is to go forward. We come to Christ, we profess Christ, then we continue to grow spiritually. The, the Christian life is, it's a lifetime of spiritual growth. At least that's what it should be. For all of us, it needs to be a lifetime of spiritual growth. I, I, one person once defined it as it's, it's long obedience in the same direction. If you stall in your obedience, you will fall. If you stall, you'll fall. You've got to keep moving. That's the great takeaway truth here this morning. That is, that, that's if you stall, you fall in this life, in this Christian walk, in this, spirit, in this time, of, in this, this, this walk and road of spiritual growth. If you stall, you will fall. 
Does that seem pretty straightforward to you all? Like, have you ever been in a situation where it's like maybe you've not gone to church for a month, six months, and, you know, life starts to sort of feel like a train wreck or something like that? Or shoot, maybe you go every Sunday, but sometime in the middle of the week, you get caught up in something and you stall and you fall. How many of, how many of you have stalled before? Just be real with me. Only a few of you? I'm preaching to the wrong people this morning. You guys got it figured out. You need to be preaching to me. If you stall, you fall. You've got to keep moving forward as a follower of Jesus. And the moment you stop moving forward is in reality the moment you're starting to reverse your direction. And it's so important for us to understand because being a Christian, as we all know, it's not just simply praying a prayer. It's not only knowing Christ as your friend, but also knowing Him as your Lord. And it's not just knowing Him as your Savior, it's also knowing Him as your God. Here's the problem. Some people, we just don't quite get that, quite honestly. And people are are, perpetually in a baby-like state as a Christian. I'm sure many of you in here love babies, right? Who doesn't love babies? I'm not going to ask it. Who loves babies? (laughs) I mean, who loves babies? Well, I think all of us have somewhere in our heart where we love babies, right? But you know that babies need help with everything, especially when they're newborns and kind of growing up in their first few years. You have to change them. You have to feed them. You have to watch over. I've got four, right? I've brought up, I've, I've, uh, not four babies, right? Well, they're my babies, but they're older now. So I've, I've been through it. You got to watch over them constantly, and, and as they get older, and they, as they get older, though, they, they really start fending for themselves eventually, start getting themselves into messes and getting into the cupboards and pulling stuff all over, toilet paper, whatever it is, you know, they get into everything eventually, and they start fending for themselves, and then as you get older, right, then they're off and they're on their own and doing their own thing. But eventually they hit those toddler years, right, and that's where all the trouble begins, that's what my experience has been. As newborns, it's really you taking care of them and, and feeding them and doing everything for them. They're so dependent on you, but once they get in those toddler years, that's where the trouble begins. Y'all can vouch for that, right, those that are parents? As a parent, though, I mean, there's a, part, there's a point in time where it's like you can't hardly wait until the child starts walking. And once they start walking, you're, you're like terrified of the problems they face and the situations they get themselves into, but it's cute when a baby is a baby, but it's not cute when someone that is much older is behaving like a baby. It, this is the problem with some Christians. They've known the Lord for, for five years, for ten years, but they're still acting, in effect, like baby Christians. And look, when, when we become a believer... We are dependent on others for our spiritual growth in many ways. When we become a believer, we're dependent, right? Reverend Jamie, throw 1 Peter 2.2 up there. 1 Peter 2.2 says, As newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. And if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. So this, when you get saved... As newborn, that's what, that's what this is talking about. As newborn babes, you're dependent. You're dependent. There's no shame in that, by the way. No. When you first come to the Lord, there is absolutely no shame in you being dependent to help you grow spiritually, to know this, to you know, figure this thing out. There's a reason why you, why you latched onto it, right? You're, you're very hungry for the word as an indication of your spiritual health because, you know, as we talked about in my message from a, a few weeks ago, hungry people, hungry people are healthy people. And healthy people are hungry people. How many of you have been to the doctor before and the doctors ask, how is your appetite? How is your appetite? He'll ask you that because if you're really healthy, you're hungry. So if you've come today, listen to me, all of you. If you've come today hungry for the Word, that is an indication that you 
are growing strong spiritually. If you show up to church and you are hungry and you are thirsty, that is a clear indication. It says in the Beatitudes, They that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. So if you, it's exactly, pastor just says that's as simple as it gets. I couldn't agree more with that. If, if you're hungry, you're healthy. If you're not hungry, you are unhealthy spiritually. If you lost your hunger for this, if you lost your thirst from this, quite honestly, some folks aren't here right now because they've just given up, right? Right? Some of you are here this morning because you're hungry and you're thirsty and you haven't been here in a while and you, you need a refill. So if you've come today hungry for the Word of God, that is an indication that you're strong spiritually. In contrast, though, if you have the attitude, well, I really know the Word of God, so, so well, I, you know, I've heard it and, and I've heard it for so many years and I know so much, I don't, I don't need to hear it anymore. That's actually a bad indication that, um, yeah, even people that say, you know what, I don't, you don't need to go to church. That to me is, I don't, I don't agree with that. You need this. That's a bad indication that you're not growing spiritually when you say something like that. So the idea is, if you're really hungry spiritually, that shows that you're on the right track. But here's the thing. We need to grow up and not always be dependent on what others give us. Okay? We have to grow up. I don't know when that time is. I can't say that one year after you become a believer, it's like now you're an adulthood believer. I, I, <laughs> there's, no, there's no set you know, timeline or framework for any of this. But at some point, we have to grow up. We have to become the toddler. We have to become the teenager. We have to become the adult in this Christian walk. In the spiritual walk. And so, you know, what Pastor and I do, uh, and Reverend Jamie and those, uh, uh, Reverend Beth and those that, that come up here and teach and talk, what we're effectively doing is we're cutting up our sermon into bite sized pieces, right? And we're, we're cutting up the words so that you can sort of grab it for yourself. You know, I had to do this when my kids were really young. <laughs> In fact, this morning I had to, I had to cut my youngest his, his waffle up this morning, right? So he, so he could, you know, into bite-sized chunks so he could eat it. We had to do that when, you know, whatever, oranges or grapes. You, I even had to spend time cutting grapes in half when my kids were younger. I don't know if that's because my wife, like, that, if, if I didn't have her, they would have had the whole grape and choking hazard all over the place, right? So thank the Lord for her telling me to cut the grapes in half, maybe even into quarters. I don't know if we went that far. but So that's what Pastor and I do, though. When we're up here and talking to people is we're taking this word and what we're trying to do because we know that not everybody is in the same place spiritually. Some of you are very young. Some of you have been in this thing for years and years and years. But regardless, what we're doing is we're cutting this word up, just like those oranges, just like those grapes, the waffles, whatever it is. We're cutting, up, cutting it up into bite-sized pieces so that you can eat it and digest it. You, and, and just hopefully you, you, it nourishes you, right? We have to grow up to a point where we can open up the Word and we can read it and process it and apply it within our lives so that the, we're not always dependent on the preacher or others to do the work for us. You hear me there? So that's what we do every Sunday is we cut this, cut this up into bite-sized chunks so that you can eat it. But eventually, you shouldn't have to be so dependent on the preacher's to do that for you. Eventually, you'll know this thing on your own. You'll be able to teach others, and you'll be able to cut this word up into bite-sized pieces for other people and have them eat and be nourished. You follow me there? You know, in fact, in Hebrews chapter 6, it talks about this. And uh, Reverend Jamie pulled that up there. In Hebrews 6, I think it's like verse 1, maybe verse 2, Hebrews 6, it talks about the perils of not progressing. 
it says, therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. So it's really that first, uh, that first part of that, therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles. What he's saying is, eventually, you have to move on past the elementary things, the things that, um, you know, You've, you know and you've already learned, you've got to grow spiritually is what the writer of Hebrews is saying. To move on, we don't, you won't get there until you're fully perfected, right? Which is, which is in heaven. But you have, to, you have to progress towards perfection. Am I hitting the nail on the head yet? I mean, am I, am I hitting any, any cylinder there for you? In other words, what we've, what we've got we have got to stop going over the basics of Christianity again and again and again, and we've got to go instead and become mature in our understanding. Surely we don't want to start all over again with the importance of, uh, of, of, of turning away from evil deeds and placing our faith in God. How many times do we have to go over like thou shalt not murder or something like that, right? We all know that at some, we have to move forward. We've got to move forward. It's called growing up spiritually. You know, when I was a kid, and quite honestly to this day, but when I was a kid, I mean, people would say, Travis, will you just grow up? Right? Like, just grow up. In fact, my wife said this to me the other day, and I'm 40 years old. <laughs> will you just grow up? You're an idiot or something like that. I don't know what she said, but... And she, she said, she, I mean, she usually says that, she, she says it because I did something immature, right, or I said some stupid dad joke or something like that to one of the kids, and she's like, just grow up. I heard that a lot, though, grow up, and maybe some of you do too, right? Some of you might be rascals, but just grow up, grow up, grow up. It's something we have to do, right? Obviously, I need to work on that a little bit. But this is the thing. You need to grow spiritually. And the Bible says that God has given us pastors, teachers, evangelists, prophets, and apostles for the building of the faith, for the work of the ministry, that we might grow up and no longer be like little children tossed to and fro, back and forth with every kind of teaching. We have to grow up. we got to know the principles and the standards that we stand on, but we have to mature spiritually. Got to mature spiritually. We need to grow up and we need to learn to feed ourselves and learn how to live and to think biblically. And by the way, the best kind of growth in a church is the growth of people coming to Christ. I mean, that's, that's the starting point. That's the starting point. You've probably heard pastors say this before. He, he's, he shared a testimony where he, um, I think somebody had come to him asking him for prayer. And quite, this has happened more than once. But people come to him asking for prayer, and it's fine to do that. But his first question is always going to be, have you prayed first? Have you gone to the Lord first? Have you sought him out first? I can help you with that. But don't put all the onus on me as a preacher. You're just, you and I are just, we're human beings, right? Just because I carry the title or the designation of preacher doesn't mean that you've got to bring all of your, your cares, your burdens to me. It's fine if you do, but bring your burdens to him first. Ask for direction from him first. Okay? That's a part of growing up spiritually. You know, some ministries, they, they grow by uh, by folks transferring from another church, meaning that, you know, folks left their church and joined this one. But the best kind of growth is when people come to Christ and then they come into the ministry. That's an awesome, an awesome way to grow the church is just by new believers coming into the church, right? I think we would all love to see, uh, we all love to see people coming uh, for the first time and, and joining something. But this brings us now to the theme of what I want to talk about today around discipleship. So I ask you at the very first part of this message, are you a disciple? I want to talk about, though, going to this next level, if you will. Growing up spiritually and becoming the mature man or woman of God that we are called to be. So we are no longer little children always having to be taken care of. 
a disciple is on the next level. I asked you early on if um, basically the, the question was, are you a, do you call yourself a Christian? And do you, not all Christians, right? I told you that not all Christians get the authority and operate in authority. This, this thing called discipleship is next level. It's where we all need to aspire to be, is at this level of discipleship. So I'm going to ask you the question again, are you a disciple? Some of you may be saying, I still don't know, and that's fine. Let's talk about it here. But I want to talk about this going to, the, going to that next level, growing up spiritually. So we're no longer those little children, right, that need to have everything cut up for us and, and fed to us in those bite-sized chunks. Let's go to the end of Matthew chapter, uh, chapter 28 again. It's a very familiar text, but I want to break it down and think carefully about it because this is one of those verses that we quote. Some of us probably have it memorized. But I wonder if we understand what it's saying when Jesus tells us to go and make disciples. Jesus himself is talking about disciples here. So i got to ask my question. If Jesus, if Jesus says this, I have to ask myself, hey, Travis, are you a disciple? Hey, Dave, are you a disciple? Travis, are you a disciple? Right? Got to ask ourselves that question. Well, he's saying go and make disciples. He's telling the, the disciples to go and make disciples. What is a disciple? We talk about what a disciple is, and I'm, ask, I'm asking the question, are you a disciple? By the way, the words we're about to read here in Matthew 28... These are the last words of Jesus while he was leaving the earth, right? He was saying these things as he was ascending to heaven. And as you know, last words are important, right? Whoever, I mean, whatever, if somebody's leaving this earth, right, you always want to know kind of what their last words are. Maybe a gruesome thing for you, but oftentimes when folks are, you know, sent to a death chamber or something like that in prison, They'll ask, do you have any last words? Last words are important. If you've gone through this before with a mother, father, child, or something like that, right? You want to know sort of what the last thing they said was. What are they going to leave you with? And that's what's happening here in Matthew 28. So Jesus is about ready to leave this planet, leave this earth. And he was saying these things as he was ascending into heaven. There's an emphasis on last words, and there should be. These are, in fact, the, the last words of Christ on this earth, and here's what he says to us. These words are a charge. These words are a commission. It's called the Great Commission. Jesus' last words to the disciples were these. Let's read it, Reverend Jamie, 16 through 20. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had, had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority, there's that word authority again, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. These are very important words, go and make disciples. We say, that's right. I need to go and make disciples. What does it mean to make a disciple? I have no idea, but I'm going to go do it. Listen, before I can make one, I have to be one. It said it right there. Jesus is talking to his disciples, so they are one. In order for them to go make disciples, they are disciples. You have to be one in order to make one. It takes one to make one. It can't take a, I can't take a person any further than I myself have first gone. It's sort of like when you're on an airplane. 
and, and they're going through the, you know, the safety drill of what you need to do in case of, a, of an emergency. And they talk about the mask, mask dropping down from the, the uh, compartment above your head. And what do they tell you? They, they always tell people to put the ma mask first on who? On yourself. And then take care of the child or the person beside you. It's, it's confusing and it's almost counterintuitive to do that. You would think, no, get oxygen to the child first and then to yourself. But that's not how they instruct you to do it. They say, do, deal with yourself first and then you can help the child. Why do they do that? Why do they do that? Because if you're blacking out, you can't do anything for the kid. So do it for yourself first and then tend to the child. You're useless if you don't take care of yourself first. It's all, I mean, this is counterintuitive, right? So it feels like it, but hopefully I, I demystified that for you a little bit. But the, the idea is that to be a disciple... I need to be a disciple, then I can go make a disciple. And maybe one of the reasons I'm not making disciples is because I don't even know, basically, I, I don't know what a disciple actually is. While it's true that not every Christian that makes a profession of faith is a Christian, it's equally true that not every Christian is a disciple. Maybe some of you might leave after I say that. Let me repeat that because it's worth repeating. What, what, it's true that not every Christian who makes a profession of faith is actually a Christian because you got to wait for the fruits, right? While it's true that not every Christian that makes a profession of faith is a Christian, it is equally true that not every Christian is a disciple. Write this down if you have a pen and a piece of paper. Every disciple is a Christian, but not every Christian is necessarily a disciple. They're not in interchangeable words. Christian and disciple are not interchangeable words. There's a distinction. Actually, the author C.S. Lewis, if you've heard of uh, the author C.S. Lewis, he once said, all who are called to salvation, all who are called to salvation are called to discipleship. No exceptions, no excuses. Everyone. What is discipleship? Let's demystify that a little bit. I want to break it down so we can understand it. Discipleship is simply this. It's living the Christian life as it was meant to be lived. Living the Christian life as it was meant to be lived. New Testament discipleship is really like I mean, it's, it's living like a believer. I'm not talking about today's believers. I'm talking about believers that changed the world. The believers of the first century. They were disciples. They got it. They understood it. And if we want to be a disciple, we need to be as much like them as possible. But some don't want to do that, and that's, that's why today I want to talk about this thing a little bit. You see, many, maybe all of us, Want to avoid, how many of you love hardship? How many of you love difficulty? If you raise your hand, I'll let, yep, come up here, I'll pray for you. Who is that, Sophia? Yeah. <laughs> Nobody raised their hands, right? Nobody loves hardship. Nobody loves difficulty. We're sort of like water, right? We're, we're like water. We want to take the path of least resistance instead of discipleship road, Water, right, rivers and streams finds the path of least resistance to get where it's going. To a lake, to a pond, wherever it's going, it's taking the path of least resistance. That's sort of like us. We want the path of least resistance because none of us love hardship, none of us love difficulty. We want to take that path of least resistance and not discipleship road. Discipleship road is challenging. It's challenging, but it's also fulfilling. It's hard, but it's, it's, but it's more than worth it because it's the road to the Christian life as it was meant to be. Ask Peter, right? If you, if you ever have the chance to talk to Peter, ask Peter if discipleship road was easy. Ask any of them if discipleship road, they could have chosen a different path. They could have chosen a path of, 
of less resistance than what they chose, but they chose Discipleship Road. That road is the very road to life. In fact, any short, anything short of this is, is disobedience to what God wants us to do. So no, we're, we're not all being disciples we, as we ought to be. And, and then as, as part of that, we're not discipling others as we ought to. It comes down to this. You are either being discipled or you should be discipling someone else. Does that make sense? You are either a disciple or you're discipling others. You should be being discipled by growing and learning what it means to be a disciple. Or you should be in the process of being a disciple in someone else. In other words, you should have a new believer under your wing that you're hoping to grow spiritually as you teach and model for them what a Christian looks like. Or you should be being discipled by someone to mature more than you are right now spiritually. When I first became a Christian, you know, I, I started to hang around some, some older folks, some godly folks. People more spiritually mature than I was. And I started making friends with godly people, men and women. I started listening to different things and other people and worship music, right? I started listening to that instead of the garbage that I was listening to. I, I started listening to other people. Other people, right? Through, uh, whether, Jensen Frank, I mean, start pastor, whoever it was, just starting to try and understand this thing and grow spiritually. I wanted to learn from them. And my feeling was, why, why do I want to hang around? Uh, why, do I, why do I want to hang around with people my own age? They don't, they don't know any more than I know. I want to be around some older folks, some wiser folks. <laughs> who have been in this thing for a while, and they've, they've walked with the Lord, and, and so that I can glean from their experiences and learn from their knowledge. That was the point. It's a great thing for you to have in your life, and I hope you, you, you know someone, and I hope you know somebody who has accepted Christ recently, and you can stay personally engaged in helping them grow spiritually. That would, that would be discipleship right there. If you know somebody that recently accepted the Lord, stay plugged in with them. Help them. Help them grow spiritually. That's where I was. That's probably where you were when you first joined this thing. Right? It won't only be a blessing for them, but quite honestly, it'll be a blessing for you too. No, we're not, we're not all disciples, and that's because we don't actually understand what it means. When Jesus walked this earth, he spent a lot of time with his disciples. We think of the Sermon on the Mount, and we imagine Christ standing there and giving that sermon to the multitudes gathered there, right? Is that what we think of when, with the Sermon on the Mount? He's talking, about, talking in front of thousands of people. It's actually not what the Bible says. The Bible, as we read in, in Matthew chapter 5, it says that, that one day as the crowds were gathering Jesus went up to the mountainside with his disciples. Not with the multitudes. He went up with his disciples. And he sat down and he taught them. And this is what he taught them. And what followed was the Sermon on the Mount. A couple chapters out of the book of Matthew. He was talking to his disciples. In other words, Christ wanted to reach the multitudes. And instead of giving a loud sermon to the gathered crowds and the multitudes... He took the time to invest in his disciples. And really that word sums it up because it's a word that means a learner. You're, all, you're a learner if you're a disciple. He was teaching the disciples. He instructed the disciples, the ones that, the ones that, that weren't curious anymore. They were, they, were, they were more than curious. They were his right-hand men. And they were willing to take that next step and be taught what it means to be a disciple. They were sitting at the master's feet and they were learning. It says he sat down and he taught them. And that was the custom of the day that the teacher would sit and the people would often stand. I'm thinking maybe right now for the rest of this service, I'm going to sit and everybody else gets to stand. <laughs> nah, you, you wouldn't be able to fall asleep then. Jesus was spending time with his disciples, and they were learning and growing as a result. And if you were a disciple, a disciple should have a receptivity to his word, because Jesus in John 8, 31, 32, if you could bring that up, Reverend Jamie, John chapter 8, 31, 32, 
So you have to have a receptivity to his word because Jesus said here, he says, uh, Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are what? You are my disciples. Next verse. And you shall know the truth. There's a dependency here. We quote this all the time. Don't we? we? We shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Go back. What's the dependency? You have got to be a disciple. For that other verse, that next verse to work, you've got to be a disciple. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. Next one. And you will know the truth. And the truth shall set you free. Oh, we love verses like this, right? We love quoting this stuff as a Christian, right? As a, a new believer, it's going to set, this truth is going to set me free. If I don't do anything, God's going to do it all. He's going to set me free. He's going to, you know, lemonade's coming out of the water fountain and, and everything's going to be wonderful in my life because the Bible says, I will know the truth and it will set me free. It ain't that easy. Because, last verse, Reverend Jamie, you have got to take discipleship road in order for that to happen. There's a book called uh, Design, Design for Discipleship, and it's by a gentleman named Dwight Pentecost. What a name, right? Dwight Pentecost. He pointed out three phases that we go through in life as a Christian. We go from curious to convinced, to committed. I believe that. <clears throat> we go from curious to convinced to committed. We start with curious. This isn't really a believer at all. Well, there's a lot of curious people out there, right? There's a lot of curious people. Scribes and Pharisees were curious. You're just curious. The multitudes were curious, right? At the Sermon on the Mount, they came like, who is this Jesus? I'm a, I want to listen to this guy. It's like the best public speaker out there now. Let's go listen to Jesus and see who this guy is. They're curious. Not really convinced yet. Not really committed yet, but they're just curious. Who is this guy? Right? Let's, let's see who this guy is and see what he's all about. The multitudes were curious when they showed up at the, at the when for right, after, right before the Sermon on the Mount. There were the multitudes. They were curious people. Wherever Christ went, crowds would gather because they were curious. What's he going to do today? What interesting things will he say today? What miracles might he perform today, right? Let's go watch. Let's go see him heal the blind. Let's go see him, you know, bring, uh, bring hearing back to the deaf. Let's go see him uh, make a lame man walk. Let's go see him empty out a, a, a tomb or something like that. They were curious people. A lot of you might be curious here this morning. Of course, they really loved it when he took the fish and the bread and he multiplied it. The curious people loved to see that miracle, right? They had that miracle in their bellies after, after Jesus performed it. They loved seeing him raise people from the dead, giving sight to the blind and, and, he, and hearing to the deaf. All those things are awesome, but free lunch? Like, that's, that's what they really loved. They, they loved uh, uh, that, that miracle of the loaves and the fishes there. I mean, free lunch? Now we're talking, right? His, his most popular miracle was that. So people would gather and they were curious, but that's all they were, were curious. Then when Jesus was done, they would go back home and it had real no, really no impact on their life. They were just curious people. Then some folks became convinced. Some were curious, became, some who were curious became convinced. Some who were convinced. Uh, um, and then some who were uh, con convinced became committed. They had a great ad some folks had a great admiration for Christ, and so they started to follow him, but they didn't fully understand who he was yet, but they were following him, so now they were convinced. So these curious people, it's sort of like a filter, right? You've got a bunch of curious people coming to him, and then there's some folks that latch on. Those people that latch on, they're convinced. That, okay, this guy's real. He is who he says he is. So now I'm convinced. I've seen him do it. And now I'm going to walk with him a little bit more. 
because I'm convinced. And here's the interesting passage in John uh, chapter 2, verse 11, when Jesus performed the first miracle, uh, the miracle with the, the you know, um, the water into wine. When he performed that sign in Cana of Galilee, when he turned the water into wine, we read this. It says, This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory. And what? His disciples believed in him. So now they're convinced. I don't know if they were just curious before this. I feel like they were. But when Jesus did this first sign and it says his disciples believed in him, it's like, okay. Now, he's, now they're convinced. Now they're convinced. They were going, and eventually they go from convinced to committed. So it's, it's possible that some of you here today, or if you're just watching over the internet today, wherever you are right now, maybe you're just curious and you're just checking things out. If, if this is your first time here, or if you're watching for the first time, maybe you're just, you're just curious and you're checking things out. In fact, maybe some of you curious people have already mentally checked out of this service already. Anybody in here? They're not listening anyway, so I can talk about them. You came this morning because that's what you do on a Sunday, is you go to church. And so you're here to just check the box. And now you're bored listening to me. So you've checked out. Now you're scrolling through social media on your phone, or you're updating your, your social media status, whatever you're doing in church, just because you're curious, right? You're not real interested. You don't really want to be here. You're looking at tweets. You're just browsing the internet or whatever you're doing. Maybe you're playing a video game, trying to find Pokemons. I don't, I don't know, but I don't know what you're doing, but you're just curious. You're, 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 but you're not that curious because you're already checked out. They, they can't hear me, so it's okay that I talk about it, right? They're not paying attention. But some of you are convinced The convinced people are saying, I believe everything you're saying. And I think this is also true, and I love the fact that this is also true. But convinced people haven't really acted on it yet. I mean, you might even come up to me after, the convinced people might come up to me or pastor, whoever's ministering on that day, and say it was a nice sermon and I really liked it, but it will have no impact on your life. Here's what I'm hoping. I'm hoping that some of you will go from curious to convinced, and then even more than that, that some of you will go from convinced, all of you will go from convinced to committed. We're not going to just hear this message and say, oh, that was a nice message. No, we're going to hear this message and say, I'm going to be committed, and I'm going to do something about it. More specifically, I want to personally be a disciple of Jesus Christ. So let me ask you this. Who in here is curious? Everybody should raise their hand. Everybody is curious, right? Who in here is convinced? Hopefully it's the same number of people, but I have to imagine there's some hands that might have went down because there might be some people that are just in that curious state, not quite convinced. Raise your hand. Curious people. Who's, who are my curious people? People that aren't paying attention don't have their hands up. Who are the convinced people? Who are the committed people? I hope all of us are. I hope all of us are committed to this thing. Otherwise, you are wasting your time, honestly. If you're just curious and not yet convinced, you're wasting your time. You're wasting your time. There's a reason you're doing this thing. So what does it mean? Now, how do, you go from, how do you go from convinced to committed? The answer is in Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14, 26 through 27. Jesus says, this is a, pastor, this is a hard scripture to preach on. This is a hard one to preach on because it is confusing and makes people scratch their heads like, I'll get out. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, Brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life also. He cannot be my what? Cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross, we talked about this already. Whoever does not bear his cross and come after me, what? 
cannot be my disciple. Those are pretty amazing and strong words at the same time. Man, this Jesus guy, he is just rude. Like, who does he think he is telling me that I have to hate everybody? If you come after him and you don't hate your father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and even your own life, you can't be his disciple. And if you don't bear your cross, you can't be his disciple. Two times he says, if you don't do this, you can't be his disciple. He said it twice. These are absolute prerequisites to being a disciple of Jesus Christ. And I think that we, we, uh, that we must understand that these things are not optional. They're not optional. You see, a lot of people, a lot of people are fair weather followers of Christ. You know what I mean by that? These, these are the people that are likely either in, in this curious state of mind or possibly they're, they're in a convinced state of mind. They'll follow him when it suits them. They'll follow him when it appeals to them. They'll follow him when they are going through a rough patch in life. They'll follow him when they're nervous about world events, right? Those are the, those are the fair weather people. I mean, come on, there's, there's plenty in the world right now going on that, that's concerning, isn't there? I mean, there's, there's a crisis, there's plenty of crises in our country. It's a mess, and it seems, it things, it seems like it, the thing's just escalating quickly. Let's say, for example, that we found out that, you know, China or Russia or North Korea was getting ready to hit the button to send a nuclear weapon to this country. Do you think people would show up to church on Sunday? I would think that we'd have maybe a, a, a greater crowd on a Sunday like that if we knew for certain that one of these, you know, enemies of, of, of the state, really, are getting ready to nuke us. I would think, I would hope that we'd have this place overflowing with hungry people and people that are lost. We'd all be here and that's good. It's a good place to be. We'd, we would pray and we would, we would call on the Lord and that's what we do in times of crisis. But when the crisis is gone and maybe the nuclear weapon isn't sent or it's diffused somehow, we say, thanks God, see you next Christ, or crisis. Those are the fair weather Christians. Those are the people that uh, show up when times are when they are in desperation mode or something like that, the fair weather uh, Christians. You know, I wasn't very much into church in 2001, but I, educate me here. What was church like after 9-11? I, I was down in South Carolina at college, my first year of school. Pastor says it was packed. I imagine some of you might remember what churches were like after 9-11. I've heard that many churches, they couldn't accommodate all the people, and it almost looked like a revival because a terrorist group hit us in the World Trade Center, and those things came crashing down to the ground, and people said, oh, we need God. I've seen videos where there were prayer vigils on street corners. Congress stood on the steps, and they spontaneously, spontaneously broke into God Bless America. It was amazing in many ways, but when the crisis passes and there's no more terrorist attack, at least for a while, we just go back to our old ways. There was sort of this, this short blip in seeking God, like a quick bell curve, and then it went back down. So my point is simply this, that there's a lot of people that say, I'll follow Jesus when I need help. And it's sort of like Facebook friends a little bit. I, you know, I don't understand a lot of people on Facebook, and there's so many people on Facebook that I think literally spend their entire waking hours on that platform just criticizing everything. And, and I, think that, I think Facebook is a place for people that like just to, you know, be critical and, and to argue about stuff. But there's a lot of affirmation out there, too. But that's, um, you, some of the bad stuff always highlight or overshadows the good stuff. But strange people out there in Facebook land. Just opining on everything. And I'll be honest with you, I like to block people every now and then. <laughs> I like it. To some extent, uh, there's probably folks in your life that you want to block in real life, not just on Facebook, right? Hmm. All right. Well, I'm almost done, I promise. I think Jesus has a lot of Facebook friends, and they're just like that. And by the way, he knows when we unfollow him. Jesus knows when you unfollow him. There's a follow button on social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all these platforms sort of have their follow button where you go and 
click the button and you become friends with somebody or you start following all their activities. But some of those people, right, that you've, you've followed, now you want to unfollow because you don't like their content, you don't like what they're saying, so you click the unfollow button. Jesus has the same sort of mechanism. He knows when you unfollow him. He knows when you're not close to him. There's a lot of people that unfollow the Lord after they supposedly were following the Lord, but the reality is they were never followers to begin with. There's a lot of folks out there like that that weren't quite followers to begin with. So one of the main points here with this message, message, the disciple, going back to this verse that we just pulled up here, the disciple must love Jesus more than anyone or anything else. That's what that verse is talking about when it's saying to hate all these things. I'm going to try and bring it back up here so you can see it. Reverend Jamie is pulling all kinds of duties here this morning. When, it, when, he, when Jesus is talking about this stuff, he's, not, he's truly not saying to go hate all these people. The disciple must love Jesus more than anyone or anything else. If you're a disciple and if you in turn are going to go and make, disi- make disciples of others, prerequisite number one according to Christ himself is you must love God more than anyone or anything else. He talked about the two greatest commandments, right? To love God and to love your neighbor. Forget about the love your neighbor part right now. Like, we got to start with point number one, to love God. To love God. There is so much into that, like, so much involved in loving God. Like, we could spend the rest of our lives talking on, on, on that point by itself. What does it mean to love God? If you love Him, and if you really love Him, it's sort of like by default you're going to love your neighbor. It'll just happen. If you love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, everything else just falls into place. That's what he's talking about here. He's emphasizing the point is, what he's saying is, if, if, you, don't, if you don't hate all these things, you cannot be my disciple. I know that this freaks some people out. And, and this is a translation issue we're dealing with here because hate is such a strong word. Oh, great, so Jesus is asking me to hate my family members now. Man, this is no fun at all, right? Some of you are having marital problems or saying, well, actually, you know what, I I do hate my spouse, so I think I've got this one covered. (laughs) That's not what this means. There's a very specific thing Jesus is saying here, because let's compare this with other scripture. Does not the Bible tell us in Ephesians 5, husbands are to love their wives as Christ loves the church? So how can I love my wife as Christ loves the church and then hate her? Am I not also told to love my enemies? How can I love my enemies if if I'm hating them? How does this work? I mean, what does this mean? It's confusing. Jesus was using the method of sharp contrast here. And and what he here's what he's saying. He's saying, Your love for God, your love for me, it has to be so strong. And so intense that all other loves would be like hatred in comparison. Does that that resonate? Do you get what I'm saying? Your love for God has to be so strong and so intense that your love for anything else looks like hatred. It isn't hatred, but it looks like it because your love for him is so much greater than your love for all these other things and all these other people. Christ is saying, if you really want to be my disciple and if you really want to live the Christian life to its fullest, you must love me more than anyone or anything else. That's what being a disciple is. And a better way to translate it, instead of saying you must hate your brothers and sisters and so forth, you you would say you must love me 
more than brothers and sisters. If you want to be my disciple, you need to love Christ more than you love your, your husband or your wife. If you want to be my disciple, you must love Christ more than your children. If you want to be my disciple, you must love Christ even more than your own life. That's what it means to be a disciple. He's number one. That's what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 9, um, Jesus says to a guy, he says, follow me. And the guy says, well, let me go bury my mother and father. This is another confusing scripture. But Jesus says, let the, let the dead bury the dead. Come and follow me. You may read that, and I think all of us read that and think, wow, that's so heartless. Why would Jesus say that to folks? I mean, here's a guy whose mom and dad right, are, are laying dead in the street. That's at least what we're thinking. And Jesus says, hey, follow me. And I'm just like, you know what? I can't. i got to go bury my parents. No, Jesus is saying, let them, what it sounds like to us is Jesus is saying, just let them, you know, rot. You move on. Come follow me. They'll sit there and rot. Is that what happened? That's not what happened. If you understand the culture of that day, it was con this, this phrase was commonly used, let me bury my mother and father. Basically what it meant was, wait, let me wait until my parents grow old and eventually die, and then I will bury them. After all those things, that's when I'll follow you. It's another way of saying, I'll do it later. And really, it's another way of saying, I don't want conflict right now, because I've got other things going on. Because you have to understand that in some Jewish homes, if you go in and say, I'm a follower of Jesus now, uh, Jesus now they won't recognize you as a member of the family. In fact, Muslim, Muslim homes are the same way. They'll disown you. Buddhist homes are the same way. A family will literally disown you if you become a follower of Christ. But Jesus is saying, let the dead bury the dead and come follow me. But you're saying, I don't want friction with my family. I don't want friction with my husband or my wife or my kids. And if I come out as a follower of Jesus, they won't want anything to do with me anymore. Jesus is saying, listen, if you want to be my disciple, that's a price you're going to have to pay. Because if you're a real disciple of Christ, people will hate you. Sometimes they'll try to hurt you. I mean, shoot, sometimes they'll even try to kill you. I could go on and on and on here, but I think, I think this, is, uh, this is a good place to end. On that point, around he has got to be priority number one. And we have got to grow up as Christians and become the disciples that, we, that he's called us to be. There is, I've given you so many different references where Jesus himself has made this dependency on all these things happening as long as we are a disciple. It doesn't say Christian, it says disciple. Okay? It's an important thing. So two things I wanna I wanna close with here this morning and, and I'm I'm done. But I wanna I wanna end in prayer and then we're gonna go into our meeting. But the first thing is this twofold invitation that I want to do. I wanna end right now with anybody who doesn't know Jesus. I'm just going to say it, right? If you don't know Jesus, I, I want to I pray with you this morning. And if you want to know him, if you want to know him in a deeper way, let's, let's pray this morning. And then the second thing is, for those that want to make sure they are a disciple, I want to pray for you as well. If you're saying to yourself, I'm not sure if I'm a disciple, I want to pray with all of us. I'm going to leave you with these three questions again. Are you... Are, who here is curious? Who here is convinced? And who here is committed? Let's stand and pray. Lord, we come before you this morning. Number one, Lord, we want, we want to come before you and pray for those that don't know you. And Lord, we want to pray, Father God, that they come to know you this morning and know you as the, the Lord and Savior, the one that, that took it upon the cross. Took you, you, you were put on that cross for the sin of the world to deliver us, Lord. And thank you for that. But Lord, it just didn't end on the cross. No, you were, you were buried in that tomb, but you rose again. And 
You rose to eternal life so that we could have eternal life. And if any, if any of you in this house this morning believe that, just say, I believe, Lord. I believe it, Lord. And step number two, Lord, is you're calling us to be disciples. All of us are called to be disciples. I pray this morning as we leave this place, this word would resonate with all of us, Lord, and we would be that spark. We would be that spark in, this, in the communities that we work in, the communities that we live in, to ignite something for you, Lord, whether it's revival, whether it's people being saved, whatever it is, Lord, that we would be that, that spark. Lord, we would take that road of discipleship that, that might put us out of our comfort zone. It might be difficult. It might get us into trouble, at least from a world perspective, Lord, but it's all for good works according to your perspective. Lord, that we would be known as Christians and disciples by our fruits. We thank you, Lord, and we give you honor. We give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You may be seated.